When America was founded, she was strong and pure and good. And her leaders on their knees were not ashamed to call on God. But our nation in her pride has turned her back upon the right. And the clouds of evil threaten to turn glory into night. Strong wickedness has crept in like a cold and bloody thief. Those who know the Lord and do his word stand by in disbelief. For the love of God and country, we must not cease for a day. For the future of our children, we must lift our hearts and pray. Turn the tide, Lord, turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates of your power. Stem the flood of wickedness. Restore, revive. God's enemy is hard at work, undermining everywhere, breaking down foundations, twisting laws, and setting snares. He would take away our freedom and replace it with despair. And he laughs at those opposing him as if they were not there. God's children cannot sit by. We must stand up and defend. For the battle is not over till our King declares the end. We must work and fight and meet Him, not as those that beat the air. For the greatest weapon in our hands is strong. Amen. Thank you, Darlene. In a time of national apostasy, Isaiah prayed, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down. And how we need that, how we need God to work in our midst today. Take your Bibles, if you will please, to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, we'll read just verse 1. Isaiah 61 and verse 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, 
because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. I want to preach this morning on your Independence Day. Let's pray. Lord, we do need you today. We need you in this service. Our nation needs you. Lord, we pray that you would bless in this service, that you'd be honored and glorified in everything that's said and done. We pray that you would work in hearts. Lord, for those here that they've never trusted you as their Savior, they've never been born again the Bible way, Lord, I pray you'd work in their hearts that today they might understand what it means to be truly free. I pray you'd work in all of our hearts. Work in this service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Over 700 years after the book of Isaiah recorded the words of our opening text, Jesus would read them in the synagogue one Sabbath day. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, And he, that is Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, or Isaiah. And when he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, Recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Tomorrow we observe our Independence Day. We celebrate freedom. We commemorate liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. On December 3rd, 1902, a little boy was born into the Fuchida family in Japan. He was named Mitsuo. Mitsuo Fuchida. And Ten years later, on November 15th, 1912, a little boy was born into the DeShazer family of Salem, Oregon. His parents named him Jacob, Jacob DeShazer. Though born 10 years and thousands of miles apart, their lives were destined to intersect in a most remarkable way. 39 years and four days after his birth, on December the 7th, 1941, Mitsuo Fuchida awoke bright and early at 3 a.m. By his own testimony, he awoke with an intense, fervent excitement. Mr. Fuchida was the general commander of the air squadron of the Japanese forces who were positioned just 280 miles, 230 miles north of Oahu Island in Hawaii. There were six aircraft carriers and 360 planes poised to strike. As the sun was rising in the east, Mitsuo Fuchida led those 360 planes toward Hawaii, flying at an altitude of about 900 feet. Of that morning, he would later write, I knew my objective, to surprise and cripple the American naval force in the Pacific. But I fretted about being thwarted should some of the U.S. battleships not be there. As we neared the Hawaiian Islands that bright Sunday morning, viewing the entire American Pacific fleet peacefully at anchor in the inlet below, I smiled. I reached for the mic and ordered all squadrons plunge in to attack. The time was 7.49 a.m. Like a hurricane out of nowhere, my torpedo planes, dive bombers, and fighters struck suddenly with indescribable fury. As smoke began to billow and the proud battleships one by one started tilting, my heart was almost ablaze with joy. During the next three hours, I directly commanded the 50 level bombers as they pelted not only Pearl Harbor, but the airfields, barracks, and dry docks nearby. Then I circled at a higher altitude to accurately assess the damage and report it to my superiors. 
Of the eight battleships in the harbor, five were mauled into total inactivity for the time being. The Arizona was scrapped for good. The Oklahoma, California, and West Virginia were sunk. The Nevada was beached in a sinking condition. Only the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee were able to be repaired. Of the eight, the California, West Virginia, and Nevada were salvaged much later. But the Oklahoma, after being raised, was resunk as worthless. Other smaller ships were damaged. But the sting of 3,077 U.S. Navy personnel killed or missing and 876 wounded, plus 226 Army killed and 396 wounded, was something which could never be repaired. He writes, it was the most thrilling exploit of my career. In addition, there were many other smaller ships sunk and 177 aircraft that were completely destroyed. The next day, the United States declared war on Japan. Also on that day, December 8, 1941, Japanese air and naval forces attacked Guam and Wake Island. On December 11, 1941, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. By the time the smoke began to clear on December 7th, it was evident that the United States had suffered catastrophic losses, both in men and material, and that Japan had scored a decisive blow. Mitsuo Fuchida, a man who had logged more than 10,000 flight hours, by far the most experienced pilot in the Japanese Air Force, Japanese Navy, excuse me, had achieved the greatest success of his life. As the war progressed, he would eventually find himself in Hiroshima the day before the U.S. dropped the atom bomb there. He received a call from headquarters instructing him to return to Tokyo. It was a call that undoubtedly saved his life. 115 days after Pearl Harbor, 16 airplanes, B-25 North American bombers, were hoisted onto the flight deck of the USS Hornet docked in San Francisco Bay. The date was April 1st, 1942. The bombardier, the man who dropped the bombs of the 16th and last plane was Jacob de Chaser. Their mission was top secret. At this point in time, even the men involved did not know where they were going or what they would be doing. Whatever they would be doing would be directed and commanded by General James Doolittle, at that time a lieutenant colonel. The next day, April 2nd, the Hornet left San Francisco Bay and sailed out under the Golden Gate Bridge. It was high noon, and a spirit of excitement and adventure was, possessed everyone on deck. From time to time, other ships would join the convoy until the entire task force consisted of 12 ships. The aircraft carrier Hornet, another aircraft carrier the Enterprise, two cruisers, two tankers, and six destroyers. They were only about 10 miles offshore when the announcement blared forth over the public address system of the Hornet, describing something of the expedition. They were told that the objective was the bombing of Japan. They were also told that they were not going to stop at another port before the bombers would be launched for the raid. Sailors and airmen alike begin to cheer. There was great commotion, great excitement, more than 2,000 sailors on board the Hornet. The entire group was celebrating, not only because they were participating in a great adventure, because, but also they were sharing in the feeling that, uh, of many that the bombing of Japan would help to bring to a halt the awful aggression of the war. Speaking of these experiences later, DeShazer says, I sensed a fighting spirit among these men. We did not have to have speeches to point out what was wrong with Japan. Every person seemed to know that Japan was an outlaw and would have to be forced to surrender. The Japanese were taking things that didn't belong to them. They had started the war. These American men were ready to fight against such unrighteousness. And that kind of mindset and that kind of uh, spirit would only intensify uh, in the days to come. Sunday, April 5th, was Easter Sunday. In keeping with the day, there were Easter services held aboard the ship. Reports say that it was surprising the great turnout of men that came that day, but DeShazer was uninterested. He did not bother to show up for the services. It would be about two more weeks before they would be in position to attack. 
Prior to Friday, April 17th, the men on the ships other than the Hornet did not know the nature of the mission. On that day, however, the commander of the task force made this announcement. This task force has been directed to proceed to a position 400 miles east of Japan. The Army bombers will be launched from the USS Hornet. They will bomb Tokyo. And now the sailors and the other men on the other ships knew the purpose of the secret trip. When the announcement was made, it came over the loudspeakers. Most of the men were seated at lunch. They said at first there was a great quiet, a great calm as the men began to comprehend the announcement. And then there was excitement and cheering. A lot of looking forward to this grand adventure. They said a strange feeling seemed to fill the air. It was evidenced on every ship, whether on the bridge, in the lookouts, or in the crew's mass, or in the quarters. A tension arose in the mind of each one. How close to Tokyo can we get without being spotted? Throughout the hours of the evening and night, everything was grim and silent. They wrote, yet the ships were steaming ever westward. Everyone felt the zero hour was not far away. Around 8 a.m. on Saturday, April the 15th, the Hornet's loudspeakers again crackled to life with these words, Army personnel, man your planes. This was repeated many times over. The loudspeakers on the other ships blared, Hornet preparing to launch bombers for attack on Tokyo. Jacob DeShazer was in the 16th and last plane to take off from the deck of the Hornet that day. He noticed as his plane gained altitude and then circled over the Hornet for a farewell salute that the aircraft carrier had already changed course. The big ship's job was done. She was headed back to port thousands of miles away. There would be no turning back. There would be no retreat. It was do or die for all 16 planes. The pilot of plane number 16, Lieutenant Farrow, with his crew, including DeShazer, left the Hornet at 9.20 a.m. In spite of their slow speed, they reached Japan about 1 p.m. The trip was uneventful. There were very few airplanes spotted, and these apparently did not notice the American bomber approaching much of the distance over water. Open water was flown at very low altitude. The target which was assigned to DeShazer's plane was not in Tokyo, but in Nagoya, about 300 miles south of the capital city. As they approached the first target in Nagoya, the pilot said, get set to drop drop bombs at 500 feet. There is the first target. DeShazer, in charge of the actual bombing, looked straight ahead and saw some oil storage tanks. The plane went right over the top of the highest tank at 500 feet. The Shazer looked down the angle line that for precaution had been substituted for a bomb site and he let the incendiary bomb go. He tried to drop another bomb on another tank and then suddenly noticed that three bombs had been released instead of two. Here is DeShazer's own story, his own account of that event. He said, we were making a complete turn and I smelled smoke. I wanted to see how an oil refinery looked when it was on fire. To the left of us I saw where the first bombs had dropped. There was fire all over the tank, but it had not blown up yet. What I was smelling, however, was powder of the shells that were being shot at us instead of the bombs I had dropped. I had noticed a little black smoke cloud right in front of us. We flew along the coast of Japan, intending to fly on the 13th parallel to Chu Chao Lishai in China. We saw several of the other B-25s, but did not follow any of them. When night came, we saw dimly the coastline of China, but the fog was so thick we could not tell what part of China we were approaching. Our navigator, Lieutenant Barr, was doing lots of paperwork. He said we should be over Chu Chao Lishai. The pilot circled, calling on the radio all the time. No answer came back. The fog cleared off a little. We could see a town below, but no airfield. In the tanks, we had gasoline enough for only one hour. We had to do something. And Lieutenant Farrow was anxious to save the B-25 with a hole in the nose that had already stayed in the air for more than 13 hours. By flying beyond Japanese-held territory, we could get to Keon in Free China where more gasoline was stored. We might be able to see the airfield or get a response from the Chinese radio operator. After we had flown for one hour, we saw a town. Our gasoline was nearly gone. We circled the town calling and looking for lights from from an airfield, but to no avail. Finally, Lieutenant Farrow said, we got to jump. It was 11.40 p.m. The airplane was at an altitude of 3,000 feet. I watched Lieutenant Barr go first, and then I jumped. 
Unfortunately for Jacob DeShazer and the rest of the crew, it would be the Japanese who would find him. Their crew and the crew of one of the other planes wound up as POWs in Japanese prisons. Whatever hatred DeShazer felt before was now intensified a hundredfold. By DeShazer's own testimony on the morning of April 18th, he had been filled with elation, excitement, at the prospect of getting revenge on the Japanese. A few sh short hours later, he would find himself as their prisoner. For 40 months, he would remain a POW. During the next 40 long months of confinement, DeShazer was treated cruelly. He recalls that his violent hatred for the maltreating Japanese guards almost drove him insane at one point. In physical torture, the beatings, the freezing, the hot humidity, the filthy conditions, starved, so on. The mental torture, the emotional torture. For 34 months, he was kept in solitary confinement, not able to interact at all with fellow prisoners. And in that environment, not so surprisingly, his hatred and bitterness festered and grew. He was in two prisons, the one far worse than the other. Jacob de Chazer wrote, We were imprisoned and beaten, half starved, terribly tortured, and denied by solitary confinement even the comfort of association with one another. Three of my buddies were executed by a firing squad about six months after our capture. Fourteen months later, another of them died of slow starvation. My hatred for the enemy nearly drove me crazy. Their cells were nine feet by five feet. No bed, no chair, no comforts at all. But then something happened. Starting in May of 1944, 25 months after he had been captured, C. Hoyt Watson writes about it in the book, De Chaser. The exact day is not known, but a most significant event took place. There sat De Chaser in solitary confinement, hour after hour, day after day. He was homesick, hungry, discouraged, and almost hopeless. Throughout the dreary weeks of more than two long years, he had been waiting, waiting, and thinking. Recreation had been meager. The privilege of reading was almost unknown. His comrades, however, had been telling him about a copy of the Bible, which they had been reading. Then one day it, it came his turn. That was the book he had long since lost interest in, if in truth he had ever had interest in it, until after many months in prison. The light in DeShazer's cell was horribly dim. And the print was fairly small, but that did not matter. He opened the book and began to read. From then on, there was little time to sleep. He had been warned that he could have the book only three weeks. He read and read and read. He read the entire book through several times. He read the prophets through six times. Many hours were spent in memorizing. The entire Bible seemed to come alive. It appeared to be illuminated. Certain passages seemed to blaze forth with mysterious brightness. Certainly here was evidence of a profound truth. The Word has power. We also see clear evidence of the faithful working of the Holy Spirit. DeShazer had no one to guide him, such as a pastor, a Sunday school worker, a teacher, or a friend. But the comforter who was sent into the world to guide into all truth was present to guide the spiritually hungry young man. As DeShazer continued to read his Bible and study, new truths seemed to be staring at him. Increasingly, he began looking for proof of the existence of God and his revelation to human beings. As he was reading Isaiah, for instance, and thinking about the time which was hundreds of years before Christ, he came to these verses, "'Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted.'" But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Did Chazer begin to see how the prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled and revealed in the New? He became enamored with the sense of supernatural Having read the prophecies in Isaiah, he says he was greatly impressed when he came to the 27th chapter of Matthew and read how the people seeing Jesus on the cross as Isaiah had prophesied that they would esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. They reviled him, wagging their heads. He said in Matthew 27, 43, he trusted in God, 
Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The Shazer seemed to put himself in the place of the Jews. And he felt he could understand how Jesus hanging on the cross was, was pure proof that Jesus was indeed a, a fraud. And from their point of view, God had forsaken the Christ and was using this means of punishing him. Then DeShazer, following the gospel story, realized how the resurrection of Jesus was a complete fulfillment of the prophecy which was found in the Old Testament. The prophets had foretold what would take place. Daniel had said, the Messiah shall be cut off. Zechariah had said, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. The perfect agreement between the writers of the Old Testament and the New was a revelation to this new student of the Bible. He was thinking, yes, Christ died for us. This is the message all the way through the Bible. Many different people were writing, but the same message of, same revelation of salvation was the same to everyone. The same thread of thought is carried from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. I've seen proof of it, he wrote, in my lifetime. I've seen the handiwork of God. God has manifested himself for us to see. As DeShazer eagerly read the Bible, particularly the promises in the Bible, he was more and more brought to the point where he felt that the message of the gospel was for him personally as an individual. He came to believe that all of these things that were written and all of these events that took place were so that he could know that he too could have eternal life if he would place his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The desire in his heart grew to know that he himself had been pardoned from his sins. He wanted to know the joy of forgiveness. He knew without a doubt that he was a terrible sinner he came to realize that God hates sin. He read in the gospel where Jesus said, Repent ye and believe the gospel. And God was working mightily in his life and during this time. For days, DeShazer more or less unwittingly had been moving toward a crisis point of absolute decision. The prayers of his parents had certainly followed him halfway around the world. The prayers of friends were at work. The Word of God through the precious book had been illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And Christ was speaking as he was reading in his inner consciousness, knocking at his heart's door, made a great impression on this young man as he sat in his cell in that concentration camp. All of those factors would have been of no avail without DeShazer's meeting the conditions. And this he did. And on June 8th, 1944, in a horrible jail cell in a concentration camp, he bowed his knees and asked Jesus Christ to forgive him of his sins and adopt him into his family. The Shazer had been reading Romans 10, 9. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. By his own testimony, he had read that passage so many times previously in the days prior to this, but on this particular day, he said somehow it just, it just welled up in his soul and the truth of it got a hold of his life and he laid hold upon it as the very word of God. And he said, Lord, I'm very far from home and though I'm in prison, I, I must have forgiveness. As he meditated and prayed along this line and asked God to forgive him from his sins, he said there came into his soul a divine joy and inner witness that God, for Christ's sake, had forgiven him. And here is what he wrote about when he got saved. Now keep in mind, he's in a prison camp, concentration camp, horrible conditions. He said, my heart was filled with joy. I wouldn't have traded places with anyone at that time. I wouldn't have traded places with anyone. Oh, what a great joy it was to know that I was saved that God had forgiven me of my sins and that I had become partaker of the divine nature. In 2 Peter verse one, or chapter 1, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, he said, though I, though I was unworthy and sinful, I, I had, as, first P, or, or as Ephesians says, I had redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And so hunger and starvation in a freezing cold prison cell no longer had horrors for me. 
He said, they would only be for a passing moment. Even death could hold no threat when I knew that God had saved me. I wouldn't have traded places with anyone in the world at that time. When he got out of the one prison, the prison of sin that he had been so long imprisoned in, his heart bound up, he found out that the other prison didn't matter. He said the guards that he had once so hated, he now loved. The guards that he had cursed, he now greeted with a smile. Good morning, sir. And treated them with kindness and with love. Jacob DeShazer eventually did get out of prison, was returned to the United States. He went to Bible college. He got married. He became a missionary to Japan. The people he had so desperately wanted to kill, he now desperately wanted to reach with the gospel. Mitsuo Fuchida picks up the story from the country of Japan. He says, as I got off the train one day in Tokyo's Shibuya Station, I saw an American distributing literature. When I passed him, he handed me a pamphlet entitled, I Was a Prisoner of Japan. He said, I was involved right then with the trials on atro of atrocities committed against war prisoners. He said, I put it in my pocket, determining to read the story later. What I read was the fascinating episode which eventually changed my life. On that Sunday, while I was in the air over Pearl Harbor, an American soldier named Jake DeShazer had been on KP duty in an army camp in California. When the radio announced the sneak demolishing of Pearl Harbor, he hurled a potato at the wall and shouted, Jap, just wait and see what we'll do to you. In the pamphlet, Jacob DeShazer tells of his hatred and his anger and his bitterness in captivity by the Japanese. But then he told how he'd gotten a Bible, began to read it and reread it and reread it, and how he'd gotten saved. Mitsuo Fuchida said his story printed in pamphlet form was something I could not explain. He said, neither could I forget it. The peaceful motivation I had read about was exactly what I was seeking. Since the American had found it in the Bible, I decided to purchase one myself, despite my traditionally Buddhist heritage. In the ensuing weeks, I read this book eagerly. I came to the climactic drama, the crucifixion, I read in Luke 23, 34, the prayer of Jesus at his death. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I was impressed that I was certainly one of those for whom he had prayed. And during those weeks, God began to work mightily on his heart. One day he could hold out no longer. He too repented of his sins and trusted Christ as his Savior and of that date, he wrote, that date, April 14th, 1950, became the second day to remember of my life. On that day, I became a new person. My complete view on life was changed by the intervention of the Christ I had always hated and ignored before. Soon other friends beyond my close family learned of my decision to be a follower of Christ, and they could hardly understand it. Big headlines appeared in the papers. Pearl Harbor hero converts to Christianity. Old war buddies came to visit me trying to persuade me to discard this crazy idea. Others accused me of being an opportunist, embracing Christianity only for how it might impress our American victors. But time has proven them wrong. As an evangelist, I have traveled across Japan and the Orient, introducing others to the one who changed my life. Though my country has the highest literacy rate in the world, education has not brought salvation. Peace and freedom both national and personal, come only through an encounter with Jesus Christ. He said, I would give anything to retract my actions of 29 years ago at Pearl Harbor, but it is impossible. Instead, I now work at striking the death blow at the basic hatred which infests the human heart and causes such tragedies. And that hatred cannot be uprooted without assistance from Jesus Christ. He is the only one who is powerful enough to change my life and inspire it with his thoughts. He was the only answer to Jake DeShazer's tormented life. He's the only answer for young people today, signed Mitsuo Fuchida, 1970. 
two men who were sworn enemies, who had hated each other, who would have killed each other had they had the chance, became great friends and brothers in the Lord because of the one who came to set captives free. Even the picture on the front of the book, DeShazer, shows the two of them, once sworn enemies, sitting down together, smiling, reading the Bible together. Oh, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians describes the before and after for the child of God. Ephesians chapter 2, at that time you were without Christ, having no hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by, by the blood of Christ. Not by religion, not by church membership, by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were far off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You may not have spent time in a physical prison. Maybe you have. Probably nobody here has spent time as a prisoner of war. But that's not what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah 61, 1, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings, the gospel, unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. There's the bondage of sin the bondage of shame and guilt, the bondage of your own emotions, the bondage of the fear of death, the bondage of an empty life, the bondage of hatred, the bondage of bitterness, the bondage of habits you can't break, the bondage of sin. Christ came to deliver you. He came to set you free. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. There's nobody here this morning that's so good you don't need to be saved. And there's nobody here this morning that's so bad that you can't be saved. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. And Christ invites us all to come. He not only wants to save you from your sins, he wants to transform you. And here in the testimony of these two men, men that hated each other, and had they been given a chance, they would have easily, without any remorse, killed one another, became best friends, brothers in the Lord. Why? Because of Christ. Christ can do that for you this morning. In fact, the Bible says that his word is like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces doesn't matter how hard your heart is this morning. It doesn't matter, matter how many thousands of sins you've committed. It doesn't matter where you've been, how far you've gone. And God's word will still break the hard heart that you've had in your heart. If you'll, if you'll allow him to, he'll come in and wash away your sins. He'll adopt you into his family, give you everlasting life. This is Independence Day weekend. Tomorrow is Independence Day. We celebrate our independence as a nation. You want to be truly free? You want to be truly free? So, hey, live in America, one of the freest nations on earth. You can live in one of the freest nations on earth and be in bondage today. Slavery. Christ, sent to, Christ came to set you truly free. Jacob de Shazer in that concentration camp was freer than he'd ever been before in his life at the moment he trusted Christ as his Savior. I would invite you this morning. We'll have an invitation in just a moment. I would invite you on this Independence Day weekend to come and become truly free because it's only through Christ you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.
You make the choice. Lord, I pray you'd bless this invitation time. I pray that you would work in hearts and lives now. Draw the lost to yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed.